Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Glad that you could join us here. It's a Friday afternoon. Uh, I'm Stephen K. Brown from the Boston FISDO, the FAA safety team. Part of what we kind of coin is the New England FAA safety team, because we've got a terrific group of folks that all work together and we're all here today with even a special guest or two. And we decided that we would do this webinar, one on a Friday afternoon, just to see uh, how many of you show up. We're passing through about 115 of you online right now with about 200 pre-registered for this event. But we noticed that there's hardly any FAA safety events at, on Fridays and specifically on Friday afternoons. And this is a special topic that we put together fairly quickly for a specific reason. So I do wanna thank you for joining us and also kind of introduce to you who we're going to, or who is going to be joining us today. It is the New England FAST team, as we talk about. Out in Bradley, we have operations and airworthiness. We have uh, Dan Carter and Rob Leonard. Dan and Rob, you want to say hello so people recognize your names? Uh, hi, Stephen. This is Dan Carter. I'm from uh, the Bradley FISDO in Connecticut and uh, broadcasting from home today in Farmington. And um, yeah, look forward to uh, to being here. I'll be working in the background, sending out information about uh, carbon monoxide and answering questions. And uh, my name is Rob Leonard. I'm, I'm uh, the Bradley Fast team, uh, the airworthiness side of uh, the house, so to speak. And I'm uh, talking from Niantic, Connecticut, down here on the shoreline where it's raining outside and washing all the snow that we received over the weekend away. So welcome aboard. Glad to be a part of this today. Excellent. And then from both Boston and Portland, there's myself uh, from the Boston FISDO. However, I do happen to live in the Portland FISDO district. And unlike Rob, I'm watching it snow outside if I were to pull the window back and uh, just adding more and more to the accumulation. But uh, here's a picture of myself and my counterpart from Portland, Maine, John Wood, flying in the winter. Yeah, in fact, we were flying over at Alton Bay just after we did the Alton Bay seminar, Steve, and uh, yep. it was a great, great flight. Um, hi, folks. Good afternoon. I'm John Wood. I'm the Fasting Program Manager from the Portland, Maine FISDO, and I'll be broadcasting today from Florida. So even though that's a Caribbean scene in the background, the view out the window isn't much different. Um, so uh, I, those of you up in New England, um, you know, you have my sympathies. Uh, my son is uh, has been on the phone with me this morning already and told me that having a lot of snow around my place. So, so um, good luck with that. Glad you could join us today. Terrific. And helping us in the background with the uh, maintenance related questions today is John's airworthiness counterpart from the uh, Portland Maine FISDO, John Bell. John, you want to say hello? Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, just thinking about it a little bit, you know, the life you save might be your own by being here. I was going through these slides a little bit before the presentation and noticed the salamander heater in a hangar and thinking, you know, gee whiz, I use one of those out in my garage. And probably one thing I ought to have is a uh, CO detector out in my garage. It might save my life someday. And, and I went on Amazon this morning and just picked one up for a cheap $12 and some odd cents. So, um, but anyway, we, we want to welcome you and uh, glad you're here. And, uh, those palm trees behind me, uh, that's virtual. I took that picture when I was in Hawaii. It is kind of freezing rain and snow and stuff out here in Dover, New Hampshire right now. But uh, anyway, welcome. Excellent. Excellent. And we're going to have a special guest from the Boston FISDO today um, on the airworthiness side, but he also flies and has been an operator of aircraft uh, in the New England area is uh, David Keene. Dave, you want to say hello? Hi, everybody. Yeah, it's a pleasure being here. I just uh, throw out, I know that since this uh, notification has sort of come out, it's created quite a buzz at my group, which I own an aircraft and a lot of discussion. And I think the purpose of a lot of this today is just to uh, create some discussion that we can take away from here and and start around and hopefully, uh, you know, as uh, was pointed out, maybe save a life by uh, just making awareness. I know it's definitely been something that has raised my awareness and uh, hopefully we can pass that on. Yeah, true, very true. All right, and that's what it is. 
our whole opportunity here is to have some discussion, bring up some topics that you can think about and that you can discuss with your fellow pilots, your fellow technicians out there and learn a little bit. You know, why we're doing this is specifically, recently the NTSB came out with a safety recommendation, uh, safety recommendation 22-01, which is very rare for general aviation operations for the NTSB to do that. Now the NTSB can't change rules or anything like that. They do the accident investigations, but they are tasked with making recommendations to the FAA and other government uh, agencies. And they specifically did this about carbon monoxide poisoning and carbon monoxide detectors. You know, we can't at our level, at the field level, make those changes. That is something that headquarters will need to decide how they're going to operate and react to it. But as Dave and John and others were saying, this got us all talking about it again. And we're like, you know what? We're in New England where this is a factor and we need to probably do a reminder and talk about it and get that discussion going again. So we're going to talk about carbon monoxide poisoning, what it is, who's susceptible, what you see for symptoms, we're going to talk a lot about the aircraft heating systems, some accidents and issues. This specifically came about because within the NTSB safety recommendation, there's multiple accidents that are referenced. But one of the accidents that occurred that we know well occurred in John Wood and John Bell's district, but very close to where I live. I remember when the accident happened, uh, Alton Bay. And then another one we had just happened a couple of years ago, right here in the Boston district with a pilot that I knew personally and saw at safety events. Um, and they used that. And we, you know, we realized we need to definitely do some outreach with this. I'll talk about the maintenance aspects, installation equipment, and what's known as the NORSI program. And last but not least, just talk about it from a pilot certification perspective. So I was mentioning why we're here. It's because of this NTSB safety recommendation. Dan is going to upload a link that you can download a copy of that if you would like to. And as I mentioned there, and then the big one is, although they don't happen a lot, they do happen, but almost every carbon monoxide related accident ends up being fatal. This is not something, you know, that your great pilot skills are going to fly you out of uh, in relation to it. And when it hits you, the pilot, it's going to hit everybody in the aircraft, typically. And why it's important is we fly in these conditions like this all the time. Uh, this picture actually was taken very close to where that Alton Bay accident occurred, probably within about three or four miles of it. And we fly in the winter, and it's a terrific time of year to fly. And we're going to talk about this not only from the pilot perspective, but it's really important. And some of the stuff we're going to hit upon later on is so, so important for the owners and operators. And then even for the technicians out there, we'll throw out a couple things above and beyond. So this is out of the NTSB recommendation. You see all of these accidents that they referenced within it. And they are, do occur all around the country, but most of them you'll recognize do take place um, in the colder months and also in the more northern latitudes where, you know, we're starting to use the heat in the aircraft. You know, back in uh, 1997, we had that Alton, New Hampshire accident that occurred very close to the Alton Bay ice runway. And as I mentioned, the other one that happened here in New England, uh, that was referenced within the document happened in New Bedford, Massachusetts. So we do have a poll question. Why don't we go ahead and launch that? We got about 150 of you online right now. And just curious what we have within the audience. So it looks like Dan has just launched that. I have it pulled up here on the side, so I'm going to answer too. So the question is, uh, the aircraft I usually fly does or does not have a CO detector, and does it, um, does it, is it my personal, in my personal aircraft, um, does not, it is my personal aircraft, does, it is a club rental aircraft, does not, it is a club rental aircraft, and 
don't know or is unpowered. So it looks like 30, 33% of answered, let's see, no, we're up at 81% have answered. Climbing up to 84%. And it looks like it's settling down. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. And we're going to share the results. So it looks like 42% um, answered yes, it does. It is my personal aircraft. Um, it does not, as my personal aircraft is 19%. Uh, and then uh, it does in my club, a rental aircraft, 27% or 22%. Um, it does not in the club, a rental um, aircraft, identical 22%. And, and do not know is uh, only 8%. So that's the uh, results of the poll. Wow. And, you know, I, that fits in with my gut feeling. I figured we'd probably see a split all the way around. And, you know, what we're hoping to do is reaffirm for those that are using carbon monoxide detectors why you are and why it's so important. Try to convince those that aren't to maybe either change to start using them or maybe putting some pressure on for the entity you fly with to start using them. And last but not least is to make sure that what you are using for a device you're using appropriately. So excellent. Well, that helps quite a bit give us a little bit of insight, and I hope it gives you some insight too. Now, just a little bit of a review, carbon monoxide poisoning, you know, odorless, tasteless, colorless, non-irritating gas, i.e. what it gets down to is, you know, you, it's not going to be obvious to you. It, you know, maybe you have some smoke associated with it, but that's even rare many times. And what the problem is, is it binds with the hemoglobin in the blood, you know, basically keeps your blood from being able to carry the oxygen up to your brain. It's one of the four types of hypoxia that we talk about. Uh, it's a hypemic hypoxia, which means that it um, restricts the blood from being able to carry oxygen. And you have some different symptoms. You know, usually you might see some redness, skin, headache, nausea, tiredness, usually are associated, but each person is different. And that's one of the big, big factors uh, to this. You know, what also happens is it becomes cumulative. You know, if you take it away, it doesn't stop immediately. Uh, you know, it takes some time to recover from it. And as you end up getting more and more of it into your bloodstream, it really starts to affect your decision making, impairment, even motor skills, because the oxygen just isn't getting to the brain cells. And, you know, it can be exceptionally difficult to recognize it in yourself. It's usually more so recognized by somebody else that recognizes it in you. There's just a couple of the symptoms or some of the symptoms that may occur. And correspondingly, what does happen to some people is these symptoms can be associated with some other stuff, high altitude flying, hyperventilation, just not feeling well. So people tend not to recognize it. And it doesn't mean you're gonna have all, any, or most of these symptoms. So carbon monoxide wise, what you need to do is be looking for each other on this. And when we talk about the impact of it, we talk about it in relation to what's known as COHB, but the percent of carbon monoxide in the blood's hemoglobin. And Normally, we're down here with exceptionally little of it. People that smoke or maybe uh, dealing with some other things will be in the three to six percent range. Occasionally, age and the elderly have an impact on it. Confined spaces. We'll talk about that on the maintenance side. And when we talk about the concentration, it's in parts per million. But you know, it's easy to get right into this lower level if you're a smoker or not necessarily taking care of yourself. And right away, we start to see, you know, effects cognitive wise, motor skill. And then as you get up there, yes, high risk of death. And if 
you do believe it's occurring, you need to get treatment basically for it right away. Um, you know, this is a generic thing to talk about treating carbon monoxide, but it applies here too. And if you're going to treat, you need to treat for everybody. Um, you know, this isn't, doesn't affect one person in the aircraft. It affects everybody in the aircraft or in the hangar or whatever. The first thing is get out of the environment. You know, in an aircraft, it's make sure you turn the heat off, you know, open windows, open fresh air vents uh, that are not associated with the heat. Usually that will help fresh air using supplemental oxygen. You go to the hospital, that's one of the first things that they're going to do if they suspect carbon monoxide poisoning. And you're going to need medical attention. This is one of those things, you know, is you don't retreat from having those cognitive impairment or motor skills degrade rapidly, even if you get out of the environment. You need to let ATC know if you suspect that you're dealing with it, and you're probably going to need some help getting to the hospital. This is not you know, jump out and get in your car and go home type of thing. Um, you know, if you're not familiar, a typical general aviation heating system looks something like this. This is uh, off of a Cirrus, but it's a muffler that ends up having a shroud across it. And the muffler has a greater surface area on it in order to dissipate the heat. And it goes around the shroud. We'll take a look at it. Here's a picture of uh, Jeff Simon, one of our safety reps working on a Bonanza showing where it may go on the Bonanza. And here's a picture of another aircraft where you can see the shroud that goes around removed from the muffler. You can see the spikes on the muffler in relation to it. And what it does, it pulls air in, it circulates around the hot muffler and then exhausts out through the cabin heat control in order to warm up your aircraft. Now, twins, there are some that do use heat from the engines and have tubing, but you know that cools down pretty quick. Usually they need something supplemental and they end up having a separate combustion heater right in the nose of the aircraft, uh, some location such as what you see here. And those can have similar issues and we can also have other issues. A good example is I dealt with this once in an Aztec that I flew for, oh, it was almost an entire year before we finally figured it out. And if you look very closely, you can see this little spigot, white spigot sticking out the bottom of this Aztec. What happened is we had reached the point of an airworthiness directive on the heater in the nose, Southwind Janitrol, I don't recall. We pulled it out, went and got it pressure tested. However, the person that removed it left an extension pipe on it that was removed in the testing and never put back on, you know, and got lost. It got installed back without the extension, allowing it to sneak out the back. So every time you tried using the heater, it pumped exhaust air into the nose back out. We actually ended up pulling the heater sent it back. No, no problems with it. You're sure it's smoking or not? You know, it was what a hassle it was just for something simple like that. And we also had a recent accident um, or recently published in Australia where access panels, um, person taxiing around in a seaplane beaver. And with the door open, it pulled the carbon monoxide through these access panels in the firewall that weren't installed properly. Is and broken seals, rotted as you can see, dried crisp, not all the fasteners and even the incorrect fasteners is over here is what is the required fastener. And they only had a couple of them that had been modified and they used all sorts of different things. And that led to it. And it could be other issues in what you do. We talk about maintenance. You know, we operate here in New England in the cold, unheated hangars. Sometimes is to work on your airplane, either yourself personally doing preventive maintenance or a maintenance technician getting in to work on it. You end up having these circumstances where you may be using an inappropriate heater <laughs> in the hangar and be opening yourself to carbon monoxide poisoning. 
Let's talk about the accident we saw in New Bedford happened just a little while ago. Uh, and as I mentioned, knew the pilot. The pilot actually uh, came to some of our safety events, and it was a hard thing after the accident occurred. Um, the following safety event, some people did know the accident occurred, some didn't. Right now, it still is just a factual report. The final report will come out soon, and you can almost tell what the probable cause is because it's in this NTSB safety recommendation. Mm -hmm. But part 91 personal Cessna 150 was fatal, just the pilot on board. Pilot information, just so you know, not that nothing out of the ordinary there. He had owned the airplane for a while. He had flown it almost exclusively himself, recreational purposes. It had had an annual five months earlier, but it only flown 14 hours since the annual. What happened is departed New Bedford, climbed up, was following the route along the coast that he normally does. And then it started changing in terms of altitudes, going down as low as 300 feet, which is atypical as pilot, climbs up to 4,000 feet, entered the uh, New Bedford Class Bravo airspace, if I recall, without a clearance. And when Inspectors from our office did the investigation. One of the things they did find was the cabin heat was full on. It ended up crashing actually right in the middle of a city. I hate to say, thankfully, in a cemetery um, so that it did not hit anyone else. And, you know, it was a very, very high energy impact. Uh, broke off a, a limb, I really should say. Uh, you know, about as thick as this on it, you know, tremendous, tremendous high energy impact. And we had looked at this during the initial investigation. We'll take a moment for this to pop up. And I'm going to have to get rid of the laser pointer also. And this is available on YouTube still. You can see, and just remember, listen to the sound to this, see how fast things happen and recognize or think about this is a Cessna 150 here. And, you know, it was filmed by a few different people because they thought the pilot was out doing a stunt show or something like that, which was not the case. You know, horrific. And when we started looking at the accident, one of the things that caught our attention was the amount of corrosion that was on the heater muffler and also finding the heater in there. And, you know, the NTSB believes that this is an accident that was caused because of carbon monoxide poisoning is that's what it appears the NTSB is going to put in their probable cause. We also had the Alton Bay accident. John, you want to talk about this accident a little bit? Sure, Steve. Um, so let me bring my video up so you can see me. Um, okay, Alton Bay, this is a picture of a similar aircraft, but not the accident aircraft. And let me tell you how I got involved with this. I wasn't directly involved with it. I wasn't the investigator in charge, but I was out with another inspector flying a King Air that day and we were climbing to altitude. We we're gonna do some proficiency maneuvers and we switched over to the center frequency, Boston center frequency for, some, for flight following. And while we, as soon as we came up on the frequency, uh, they recognized the aircraft and they said, hey, could you do us a favor? We've lost an airplane in the Alton Bay, New Hampshire area and we'd like to have you guys go over there and take a look and see if you can find it. Um, so sure. So they gave us vectors. We proceeded to the area and uh, we circled around for a while and, and we didn't see anything. I mean, it was a white airplane, white snow. Uh, it didn't burn. Um, so there was no smoke, no fire, um, no telltale signs. It was in a heavily wooded area. And, uh, and therefore, you know, it was difficult to see. And the King is not a great airplane for doing a search and rescue, especially from the front seat, because you have those kind of large engine nacelles just outside the window and they block view, the view of the ground. Um, anyway, eventually the CAP showed up with their 172s and, and we left the site. But of course, at that point, it was curious. Uh, so I got back to the office and I called the center and talked to them. And there was another gentleman in our office who did investigate it. So I had a chance to talk with him as the investigation was ongoing. Um, but anyway, um, Steve, if you could uh, just snap back to the other, uh, the first slide. Uh, 
go back to the first one. Uh, that's the accident number. If you want to Google that, it'll take you to the NTSB website. You can download it and read it. It is a final report. And it was a Part 91 personal flight, um, you know, PA-28-236. It was a Dakota. Uh, it is the end number. And there are two people on board, pilot and a pilot rated passenger. And, and uh, both of them, of course, perishing in the accident. Um, so here's some info on the pilot. Um, it was a, he was, had a private pilot's license, airplane, single engine land, 46 years old, third class medical that was current. His flight review, last flight review was 15 months ago, so that was current. 878 hours total time and 686 in the make and model. And the last annual was in January of 96, which is interesting because when you read the report, or if you read the report, you know, this date that this happened was January 17th, 1997, the accident happened. His last annual, just through coincidence, was on January 17th, 1996, and it had been 88 hours since the annual inspection. So what happened? Uh, you can see there is a, a nice sectional chart, a schematic that Steve threw in so you can kind of see the route of flight. The aircraft was departing um, Farmingdale, New York, and going to Saranac Lake. I initially climbed to 3,000 feet, going to 8,500 feet. It was a VFR flight. He was climbing initially to 8,500 feet, but at 3,000 feet, he contacted New York ATC for flight following. Good thing to do. Um, and, uh, and they uh, worked with him. Um, 24 minutes later, the, uh, they switched him over to the center frequency. New York ATC switched the aircraft to the center frequency, Boston Center, and uh, there was no response. Um, so a couple of minutes went by, they kept trying. Eventually, a woman's voice came on and uh, she said that she was, she was a passenger, um, she was a pilot, um, but she had never flown that particular aircraft and she hadn't flown in a long time. Her only time was in a Cessna 172. Uh, and it turned out after the fact that she had about 165 hours total time. But what she did say was a bit alarming to ATC. She said they were in trouble. Um, the pilot was uh, unresponsive. It passed out. He was unresponsive. He was vomiting. And, uh, and she needed some help to get the airplane back on the ground. Well, there was another aircraft out there that overheard ATC talking with this airplane. And uh, so the POAA is the pilot of another airplane, another aircraft. And uh, ATC and this other aircraft, which had a couple of flight instructors on board, they worked with her to try to talk her down. Um, you can see when she heads out of, uh, when they headed out of Farmingdale, New York towards Saranac Lake, they're heading roughly northbound, northwestbound. Um, and they tried, ATC tried to turn her around and get her to, to come back southbound and get down to an airport. And they were kind of aiming for Danbury, Connecticut and to try to get her on the ground there. Um, but as they were doing that, about another 20 minutes passed. So, you know, we're doing the math here. We're 44, 24 minutes into the flight. We have the pilot incapacitated and we're now 44 minutes into the flight and uh, the, the uh, passenger, the pilot rated passenger reports getting tired and nauseated. Well, eight minutes after that, so we're not very far into this flight at all. Uh, the pilot reported passenger only is responding with ident, no more communication. So ATC is trying to talk to her. The pilot of the other aircraft is trying to talk to her. Uh, they're getting nothing back as far as radio communication is concerned, but ATC says, yeah, we are getting some high dents, uh, but that only went on for a short time, and, uh, and then that stopped also. Um, at that point, the airplane turned northbound and uh, began a slow climb. Um, ATC worked with the pilot of the other aircraft the, to try to get a visual on this airplane. Um, the, the aircraft was above some clouds and then down below it. Um, went up to about 8,800 feet, uh, seemed to level off with some uh, minor excursions in altitude, um, but, uh, but then eventually started a descent. And that was an hour later. Uh, at that point, the pilot of the other aircraft reported the accident aircraft in sight, that there was smoke in the cockpit and coming from the engine. Uh, nobody was sitting up in the aircraft, uh, then crashed in a wooded area, actually in Alton, New Hampshire, if we want to be technical about it, but it was uh, right next to Alton Bay, as Steve was saying earlier, right near where they have the ice runway during the winter. And, uh, and, and that, that, that was it, uh, two fatals. So you can see there the area where the aircraft crashed. Steve was kind enough to put the schematic in there and circle it in red, and that was the, act, the actual point of impact. A um, uh, couple of things there. Um, 
is that uh, you know the post-crash exam revealed that there was a cracked muffler, and uh, but but prior to that, uh, the total lapse time of the flight was two hours and nine minutes, and they're only about an hour into it when both pilots were incapacitated. Now here's the interesting part: is uh, Steve was talking earlier about the percentage of carbon monoxide in the hemoglobin or the carboxyhemoglobin percentage, the PIC at 43%. And if you remember from looking at that chart that Steve threw up, 43% is pretty incapacitating. I mean, it's, it's there. You're, you, don't, you don't want to get to that point. And uh, the pilot rated passenger eventually had uh, 69%. Um, and uh, we'll go on and take a look at a couple of photos uh, that will actually show the accident site. Uh, here is the main wreckage. Uh, this is from the NTSB dockets, accident photos taken at the site. Uh, of course, it's difficult to make out what you're looking at there, but you can tell it's a, it's a pretty banged up airplane. Um, but here's, here's the culprit right here in the next photo is, uh, is the muffler and there's the hole in the muffler. And, and I think something that Steve said earlier is really kind of important here um, just to uh, kind of really uh, imprint it on your, on your brain and what he had to say, which, which was the symptoms of hypox, of, excuse me, the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning are really insidious. I mean, they're really insidious. They can be mistaken for an illness. They can be mistaken for hypoxia. They can be mistaken for a number of different things. Uh, one of them is confusion. Um, so if a symptom is confusion and you're confused, how are you going to be able to figure out that, hey, this might be carbon monoxide poisoning? You're, you're confused. I remember when I, I did an altitude chamber ride, all of us in the FAA had a chance to do that at one point or another, at least years ago we did. And I went out to Oklahoma City, which is where our training center is, and they put us in a pressure train uh, chamber and they brought us up to altitude while we were wearing masks. And of course they, they, they blow the chamber to a much higher altitude and they have us take off our masks and, and we get to uh, see what our symptoms of hypoxia are but we also get to do things like they'll give you a deck of cards and you have to turn over a card and separate it into suits. And, you know, they film this. And so afterwards you can watch it and you can see, oh yeah, right here, I was starting to get confused. But one of the possible symptoms of hypoxia is a feeling of euphoria. You feel great. And it turns out that that was my symptom. My first symptom of hypoxia is I feel great. Kind of a lousy symptom to have, don't you think? You know, how do you make the leap from I feel great, so I must be hypoxic? You don't, you're never going to. And it's the same with the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. If you're suffering from a little bit of a headache, you're feeling a little tired, you're a little confused, you may never make that leap. So I think Steve's point really drives home the fact in the importance of having some type of carbon monoxide detector in that aircraft, and especially for those of us that fly in the northern climates and, and to have that heater on to. Uh, to uh, you know, keep the cold from uh, from uh, making us numb. So that's it, Steve. Thank you. If I can just move it around to get the unmute man. Uh, next, we're going to talk about some of the maintenance aspects of this, and this is where we asked uh, David Keen to join us because, as I mentioned earlier, David is a airworthiness um, inspector but has had his own maintenance shop, has operated a flying club or two in the past, and also a commercial pilot and flies himself often. Uh, so he has a hand in all of this. So what, Dave, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks. So uh, the last picture that we saw, the picture of the muffler, I want everybody to kind of remember that. And um, we can go ahead and move forward with uh, what we've got. So, you know, there's um, typically what we know is two different types of uh, heaters. You know, we've got the combustion type, which you see a picture of there. Um, and we'll talk briefly about these and, uh, and then the shroud type, which uh, are more prevalent in the smaller GA aircraft. Um, the one that we're looking at right here, you know, I've uh, done a bit of troubleshooting uh, and you know have run into numerous issues and they can be very intimidating but are actually very simple once you understand the wiring and how everything works uh, the key here is to make sure you get this to somebody that really 
if you own one of these or you own an aircraft with one of these, you get it to somebody that is truly qualified or is willing to spend the time to become familiar with it. Uh, one of the most dangerous things on these is wiring them improperly or bypassing some of the safety systems that uh, can really um, you know, bypass um, the built-in features that make it almost fail safe, meaning it will not run if one of these components is bad. Uh, you've got um, you know, sensors up on the top of the chamber that sense the uh, uh, pressure inside before it will even give you fuel, um, before it'll turn the igniter on. And so there are multiple, multiple fail-safe uh, features that make this an extremely um, safe uh, heater if it is maintained properly and uh, in service when it needs to be. Um, I saw one uh, article, so we can get into a big debate as to there is no way that one of these heaters can uh, get carbon oxide and, and put carbon oxide into the cabin. Uh, the key there is uh, if it, all of these, whether it's a shroud or one of these heaters is operating properly, of course, we're not going to see CO2 in the, um, in the cabin. However, what we're really dealing with is aircraft that um, are not operating properly or that are aged or uh, just have issues. The, uh, one of the things that we have to do with this particular heater is to do a periodic uh, decay test. And what that does is it's, you know, you plug it up and you uh, put six pounds of pressure in it. Typically, uh, it's going to vary. It may vary from model to model. But um, and you look to see if you have any leaks, very similar to, um, you know, what we do with a compression test. So something that is uh, appears at first to be a bit intimidating. The particular heater you see in that picture right there did not have many hours on it, but came out of an uh, actually of an aircraft that was down in um, Florida for a while and, and probably was not used. So just because a component doesn't have a lot of time on it isn't something that um, you want to uh, kind of give it a second well, it really probably doesn't need the test or it's going to be fine. You need to inspect with the expectation that you're going to find something not the other way around, which is an easy thing to fall into. Dave, actually thinking about it, it brings up a question about this aircraft being in Florida. You know, does the environment play a factor on it? You know, Florida with the salt water, the corrosion not being used, maybe sitting out in the rain, getting some moisture. Can that have an effect on it? You know, all of those things can, and whether it's a shroud heater, any kind of exhaust, you know, let's think about it. A lot of our GA aircraft that are privately owned don't get that many hours of operation. Um, and so they may not hit the inspection requirement, but it may still be in a condition where you want to invest in uh, having this checked um, or uh, and having a, a newer style uh, CO2 detector. Um, available in the cockpit to give you that early warning. Uh, the particular heater that you saw there actually was cracked and it's hard to see, but it was cracked right around the weld or right at the very base. Um, yeah, kinda, you, I can't point it out, but uh, it was cracked. And so it, in this particular case, it had to be replaced. You know, some of the things that, um, you know, why we do these kind of tests is a visual inspection is sometimes extremely hard to see. You can see pointed out in this particular picture, you know, a very, very small crack. Um, recently on my personal aircraft, I had, uh, was very surprised to find that uh, I had a crack on the end of, of an exhaust muffler. It wasn't in the chamber where it would have put CO2 in the um, cabin, but in doing the annual inspection, uh, with very few hours from year to year, I uh, was very surprised to see. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit about aging parts here before we're done. Yeah, here's another good example of, uh, you can see the crack very easily on this type of heater and where it, uh, it blew out. Get another good example. Those of you that are doing maintenance, you know, you've seen this, you've seen all this. There's nothing really new that uh, will surprise you. Uh, for owners, this is uh, something that when your mechanic shows you that or tells you you've got something going on, this is typically uh, the case. And uh, the big question is a lot of people will say, well, can't we weld that up? Well, you can. 
but then you need to really think about the overall condition of what uh, the muffler is and the age of it, uh, the fatigue of the material. Maybe it's time to replace it with a new one. Good example are some of the ADs that, um, and this is sort of a good point. Some of the, this is Kelly Aerospace. The name has changed multiple times. I'm not sure if it's Kelly or what uh, it's going by currently, but very similar type of combustion heater. Um, one of the notes to take here is if you look at some of the, you know, the Piper has got ADs out. Uh, most of them were from 1974. Um, when you had an actual AD on a shroud type muffler. Um, most of us still check the shroud uh, of the mufflers, but a lot of the ADs may not be applicable, but it doesn't mean that it's not a very good um, and money well spent to have your mechanic uh, go ahead and go through and do the inspection and, um, and spend the money uh, to keep you and your occupants safe uh, from anything that uh, could happen with that heater. I would uh, tend to uh, be a little more conservative and, and, and do it more often. This is another great example that Stephen found that, you know, where even if it's, uh, you check out the heater, you may wanna have the complete heater system checked and not just the uh, heater itself. This obviously could have caused a, and may have been causing a, a pretty significant uh, issue with uh, what was going on with the heat source. Um, obviously, if you've got failures, especially if it's associated with an AD, we want to make sure that we get, uh, you know, all these things reported and start developing some trends that uh, can help, you know, save, um, you know, someone's life. Um, one of the things that I want to touch on is the, uh, when you start looking at that previous picture of the heater that failed, that caused that, that last accident that we were talking about. Uh, it looked kind of like Swiss cheese. And one of the things to consider, just like my own personal aircraft that developed the crack, this one right here, it's possible, just in theory, let's throw out the conversation, that maybe when this was inspected, it was perfectly fine. And it a backfire or some other event that may have caused, um, you know, this at one point, at the inspection to look perfectly fine. And then three, four hours later, because of the way the aircraft was operated or because something happened in the way it was cranked or some may have caused a pressure that blew this out. So just because it looks good on the outside, if you're running into uh, aged items on your muffler system, uh, you may wanna consider uh, upgrading, going to a new one or pulling it off and doing a more thorough inspection. We've all seen the uh, things online where they're rebuilding a car and they send it out for sandblast and media blast and it comes back with holes all in it and you can see light through the metal. Um, some of this may be visually fine when you look at it, but when you really look at it in detail, you may find the metal is eroded away on the inside and may be uh, much closer to life's end than, uh, than what it's perceived on the outside. Um, so yeah, that's... Uh, some of the things that that come to, come to mind, I know that from my personal uh, take is I had sort of gotten away from even using the small, I used to use the small card CO2 detectors all the time. Um, and then for whatever reason, um, being an extremely conservative uh, person in, in how I operate my aircraft and who I put in it and protecting my friends and family, I got away from using them. I, I really am not sure why. And with this uh, uh, information that we are currently got, it started a big buzz and conversation at the, uh, at the hangar. And I now have a, uh, the CO2 detector on the left installed in mine, and I will be uh, looking at updating to uh, a, a more, uh, yeah, an electronic one. Steve's holding one up, um, you know, an electronic one. Uh, I love all the gadgets, and I can't believe I don't have an electronic uh, CO detector but I will be uh, putting one in very soon. So uh, I will uh, challenge everybody else that's out there. One, um, one of the things you might wanna look at if you're an owner is ask your mechanic, is he doing a very specific uh, shroud muffler inspection 
whenever, uh, even because it may not be required. Um, and depending on how you interpret uh, Appendix D, you may or may not take the shroud off every time and do it. We don't need to get into that debate, but bottom line is um, ask him and get a specific write off or sign off that he did the inspection. And then I challenge you to uh, put some kind of CO2 detector in there to protect not only you, but your, uh, your family. A lot of them out there and the products have improved greatly lately, which is absolutely terrific. Uh, like Dave, I've operated fleets of aircraft and I've been in the same position. You know, things start to slide a little bit. You need a reminder like this that, hey, maybe I ought to be doing this again or, or something like that. You know, we used to use the inexpensive spot detectors. Um, the how often you can use them or how long they last changes. But basically we said it that eight or nine months out of the year, we changed it right at the beginning of every month. Now, what is terrific is a lot of this, because it is a safety related issue, falls under the NORSI program. And you could go to your avionics shop and have one installed. If it's not already part, a lot of new aircraft are coming out with them integrated into glass panels and stuff. But uh, Rob Leonard's gonna talk to us a little bit about that because he's done it before. Right, yeah. Hi, Steve, and everybody else. Yes, I, my background is avionics. I worked in a repair station that installed avionics systems in aircraft and did repairs on them. And we had installed, um, back was, uh, I was back in industry uh, working in that repair station about oh, 10, 12 years ago. And we just started seeing the Guardian um, CO2 detectors come out um, and uh, uh, really, um, found them to be effective. Not only do you get the uh, visual um, presentation, you know, by a light blinking at you, but also you get the audible alarm uh, that goes on uh, with it too. And in some cases, some of these devices also um, do connect um, to um, your aircraft headphones. Um, um, so, so anyway, Steve's got this um, Norsi um, um, slide up and, and you can see an angle of attack indicator up here. That was another device that we installed under this program. Um, it, it just uh, is something that FAA looked at um, as a means of uh, installing the safety enhancing equipment that's not standard equipment and um, not required. Um, um, so again, non-required safety enhancing equipment or NORSI. Um, and it's got a, a, like a whole bunch of uses. Um, um, things that will increase situational awareness, like sensors and things that would sense um, attitude and um, be put on a portable device. Um, uh, uh, even uh, some of them are like um, airspeed and, um, and uh, altitude sensing devices that also can be put onto like a four flight system. Um, um, and it's something that's additional other than what's primary um, and it's, um, it's usually involved with warning or cautionary or advisory indications. And it, it again, also provides occupant safety protection. Um, um, these are some of the models that are on the North Sea site. Uh, the Guardian Avionics has some models there. Um, if you were to click on the items that are blue on this panel, it would lead you to the actual um, approval that NORSI um, has issued for these different manufacturers. And um, there anything from uh, um, panel mount to remote mount that goes behind the panel. Um, panel mount would be something that you'd see audibly. Um, when we get to the next slide, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. So anyway, this is a authorization that NORSI issues to a manufacturer that has created a um, safety and a NORSI applicable device. This happens to be a the one sent to Guardian um, with the uh, CO2 or um, carbon monoxide detectors and it uh, lists them by, um, by part number and, and, uh, and what, you know, what they're designed to do by model number. And uh, next slide, Steve, thanks. And, um, so Guardian offers this one on the left here, which plugs into a cigarette lighter. It's, it's, it's good because it provides both audible and visual indication. Um, I don't know what the price of it is. I'm sure you could Google it and find that. Um, I, this is the model that I installed this 451-101 um, panel mounted uh, unit. Um, and it has an alert and status. And what was nice about it is 
um, I, it, if I remember correctly, it also hooked up into your headset system. So um, one of the things that um, you should consider with either a portable device that has an audible output is the noise level in your cockpit and whether or not this portable device or even installed device where it's installed in the panel is loud enough to where you can hear it over ambient noise um, in the aircraft. Um, some of these portable devices um, may be very loud and definitely distinguishable uh, when you're flying. Others may not be loud enough depending upon where you put them in the, in the cockpit in the cockpit or in the cabin of the aircraft. Something to consider there. And then the one on the right is actually um, used to display, uh, it gets remote mounted behind the panel and it's displayed, the information is displayed on one of the uh, um, other manufacturers that has a multifunction display or flight display that would display the um, uh, carbon, um, carbon uh, monoxide levels. Um, this is at three, um, CO good detectors is another manufacturer. Um, the one on the left here um, also incorporates, it looks like a pulse ox oximeter that you put on your finger and it, it's got an app. Um, uh, it looks like an Apple app that it displays on. Um, this one here is a remote model, a mounted unit with an indicator, you know, that you can put in the pilot, um, pilot's panel right in front of you. And then the other one is uh, a remote mounted also a unit that will work with your, um, your iPhone. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this one um, I, I'm not, I wasn't familiar with, but um, it was something that I uncovered. Uh, it was made by Sentry, and it has the CO carbon monoxide detector, and it's ADSB receiver, ADSB in receiver, and it's got a GPS unit, and it's hooked up to a, a portable device, and um, would would not only you know supply your traffic information and your weather information. Um, and your position information to your moving map system and your nav you know your portable navigation system, but also adds that safety feature of carbon um, carbon monoxide uh, detector. I've got a buddy of mine that uh, um, that's a fellow inspector of mine that was home um, with his wife and living there and uh, uh, had a situation that had power outage for like a week, and so they had a portable generator that they had set up outside and they were powering it. And um, uh, the second or third day into it, he um, called in sick from work and um, said just they're feeling nauseous and, and um, having headaches and um, just didn't know what was going on. And, and this went on for like, a, like the rest of that week and, and, uh, and where they're having these symptoms and it was evidently low level of carbon monoxide poisoning that they had that was affecting their cognitive levels, you know, of even figuring out what it was, but then they finally did figure it out and they had to move the generator to another um, place outside the house to eliminate that from happening. So it, it's something that they didn't even recognize or distinguish. It's, it's a, a real um, uh, scary thing that we have to deal with. Um, um, yeah. And then slide, so go ahead, Stephen. Yeah. No, actually, when the Century device first came out, I contemplated getting one. Um, mm -hmm. I did not. However, I gave it a lot of serious thought because of the carbon monoxide detector in it. Ultimately, I did not because I wanted um, AHAR's capability uh, in my ADS-B device. I didn't just want the ADS-B weather in and stuff like that. I wanted AHAR's capability, which at the time this did not provide uh, with it. And two, I was probably spending 80% of my time in unpowered aircraft without um, a high level of risk for carbon monoxide poisoning. However, you know, if I was in the small airplane and especially you know, flying multiple small airplanes, boy, this would be pretty darn high on my list now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is another one that's portable. It's got the indication of parts per million, has an audible and, um, an, you know, an LED indicator um, as far as what the condition is. Um, it it uh, lasts, the battery life on this thing is like 10 years, which is something I thought was pretty interesting. Um, another thing you could do is obviously in flight, is to actually self-test these things to see if you can hear the audio. You know, all of them have a self-test feature. Um, go ahead and try that, uh, exercise that uh, test feature and see if you can in fact hear it, you know, with your headsets on and the ambient noise conditions that you'd find yourself in. Thanks, next, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, it was brought up, a number of people talked about this. I saw in the chat about the, um, the little indicated, um, and I, I saw a lot of these in aircraft when I was uh, in industry, and, and they're a great little device. They do have a shelf life, and they do have a, a life. I see the one there said 12 months. Uh, another one from Sporty says 90 days. Um, this is an indication of what it looks like when it's going bad and it's sensing uh, carbon, carbon monoxide. Um, uh, the next slide over in the middle here, um, this is uh, the same um, um, indicator that's gone um, five minutes into, or five minutes after being exposed to the carbon monoxide. And then the top one up there um, in the center is uh, 15 minutes into it. Um, and the same, same thing is true for both of those detectors. So, so it eventually goes back to a normal indication when it, it stops getting exposed to it. Um, the thing is, is are you going to recognize that um, in flight? Are you going to be paying enough attention to it to where, um, you know, you're going to recognize it and it's going to alert you to the condition where you've got to, to deal with it? Um, next, yeah, Steve, yep. did you have? Yeah, and there's a lot of little things with that. The last picture is how they have basically returned back after they sat for about an hour um, after exposure to it. And we'll talk a little bit later on um, here in the next minute or so about how you can find out some more information. But if you're curious, if you're a person that's learning to fly um, or doing refresher, flight review, whatever it may end up being, is a lot of what we've talked about today deals with uh, what you can find in the Airman Certification Standards or the old um, practical test standards, depending upon what type of aircraft you're flying now and if everything, but under human factors, you can see one of the items listed in there is carbon monoxide poisoning. The way the standards are set up now is an examiner has to test a minimum of three, absolute minimum of three of those items there. So, you know, there's a high likelihood. It's something that you do want to make sure that you're familiar with. Uh, with it. If you want to find out a little bit more information about this uh, area, is we do have the Boston Fast Team YouTube channel. While we have been on this program, actually, I got a little video that went live testing the carbon monoxide spot detectors. You can take a look at that, give you more information about the testing, how they work, so forth and so on. But the pictures you saw earlier came from that. And also, it's a segment to it, but we talked about the North Sea program and some more uh, webinar that John Wood and I did back a while ago is the aftermarket safety equipment, making you and your airplane better. You can find that video. It's a recording of a webinar um, on there. So as we finish up here, you know, every time we need to think about what is it that we want you to walk away from this webinar with today, and we have a few review questions that we want you to be thinking about as you depart is, are you familiar with what is an EPIC, or N, <laughs> excuse me, an NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board safety recommendation? And you probably wanna take a look at the one that we just um, provided to you that came from the NTSB only a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's unusual for the NTSB to issue safety recommendations associated with general aviation aircraft. You know, and what they ask, that's gonna be the higher ups in the FAA to decide associated with aircraft certification on what, how they react to that recommendation. You know what carbon monoxide is? How does it, what does it do to you and your blood? What are the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning? This is all the stuff that you're probably gonna answer in that practical test or on a review or something. We've spent a lot of time here today, which is um, good. But how is carbon monoxide produced in a small GA aircraft? And, you know, when is it dangerous to you? Is it only in flight? Uh, you know, the Australian accident, we think, occurred um, because of taxi. Is actually, they taxied for 27 minutes. Um, and they think that's where the carbon monoxide poisoning came from. How do you recognize, detect? That's one of the important things. There's so many things out there and available, and there's so many other uh, entities that can help you decide what is going to be best for your situation. But what we strongly encourage is a detector that is accurate, that gives you visual and also audible 
uh, indications. The spot detectors are an inexpensive way to go, but you got to be able to see them. And there's some other issues. If you watch the video, you can find out about carbon monoxide poisoning if you suspect it. And remember, it's treat not one, but all. And what should be de being done to your aircraft when you're sending it in for maintenance, annual 100 hour inspections? You know, if you're flying in a cold weather environment, this is one of those things you need to go above and beyond the minimum requirements. You know, you need to ask your maintenance facility, as Dave was saying, to do a better inspection on it. Because you take a look at all those accidents, they're all occurring in areas you know, in northern latitudes where people are flying and it's cold. And then also, what is the NORSI program? We, we talked about that. Is um, Rob covered for us a lot of different types about the installation and the NORSI program makes it a lot easier for all of us there. So we do want to thank you. You know, the big thing is we want you to be proficient pilots. You know, and that involves regular proficiency. If you don't already, we strongly, strongly encourage you pilot types to go ahead and do a proficiency check once per year uh, with your flying club or whatever it may be. And if you don't have a program, definitely do participate in the FAA WINGS program. You can always participate in both and there's benefits associated with that. For the maintenance types, we have the AMT training and more and more courses are being added on FAAsafety.gov all the time. So we do wanna thank you. You know, We appreciate you taking the time today. I hope you enjoyed your lunch while also learning something and we look forward to seeing you again in person soon. So from myself and everybody else that's out there, we wanna say thank you for joining us today.